Hello, listeners. This is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. Our 13th and final lesson for this quarter, The End of God's Mission, is ready for teaching on December 30. It's the final lesson in the series God's Mission, Our Mission. Your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 23. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we've come to the end of this series of lessons on mission, and our lesson this week is titled The End of God's Mission. As we open your word, we pray that we may be part of that end of your mission, that whatever we do in our lives may be able to share with others your love and your grace and the story of Jesus and his soon return. We pray that you'll not only bless us with the opening of your word, but in our daily and personal lives and in our families as as well. Lord, today I'd like to pray for Angela Lowe and her family and Dwayne and uh, uh, the the two sons and the Orlando East Church in Soweto in South Africa and Leah Takai Vikaso uh, from a 20-member church <clears throat> on the atoll of Wachi Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Um, Leah has asked for prayer for her church and also from the Winnipeg Central Church in Canada as well. And Roan Candle and has asked for prayer for his brothers and sisters and son who have need of you at this time. And Nasa Savina and Dalton and brothers, please, Lord, be with them in the decisions that they make on a daily day basis. <clears throat> and Cheryl and Avalrado Gatino from, from the Philippines, Lord, I pray that you'll be with her and her family and her local church. And then to finish for today, Hope Bennett of Canada, Lord, each of these people have asked for a request for prayer, and I I pray that you'll be with them in their personal lives and that your Holy Spirit may help them know and understand that the Jesus who gave his life for them is the one who will stand by them on a daily basis. Bless us now as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God? Let's read that again, Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? The book of Revelation fills the mind with scenes of the end. The epicenter of the book deals with the cosmic conflict between Christ and Satan. Satan has lost his legal hold over the earth, and now he pursues those who remain loyal to God. The book climaxes with Jesus' return to deliver his children, both the living righteous and those faithful ones who have died since the fall of Adam and Eve. The book shows us, too, the destruction of Satan and the wicked by fire, and Jesus' establishment of his eternal kingdom on the earth made new. Students of Revelation enthusiastically explore and seek to identify the predicted signs and events that mark church history from the first century AD to our day in the end of time. They are right to do so. However, In this quarter's final lesson, we will see that Revelation is a missionary book focused on a missionary God who is calling us to be a missionary church. Our calling to proclaim present truth to the world will exist right up until everyone has made the choice for or against God. Sunday, December 24, Revelation, God's Last Day Mission. The opening lines of Revelation indicate to the reader that this book is focused on God's mission. 
Read Revelation 1, verses 1 to 7. In what ways do you see evidence that Revelation is focused on God's mission in the last day? Let's start at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the word of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests, to his God, And Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so. Amen. After revealing in the first verses that Jesus is the source and focus of Revelation, Revelation 1 verses 4 and 5 alludes to all three members of the Godhead who are working unitedly to save human beings. The Father is the Eternal One who was and is and is to come. The Holy Spirit, who is working powerfully among the first century churches, is named. Then John recalls the status of Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead in verse 5, who possesses legal ownership of this planet. Satan's attempt to use this earth to establish his kingdom is ruined. In addition to God's victory over Satan, our Creator's shed blood washes away our guilt and shame. Read Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 again and 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 29. What do the titles for the redeemed of these verses signify? First of all, Revelation 1 verse 6, And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. And First Peter chapter 2 verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, into his marvellous light. The focus of God's mission is not simply to drag perishing people to safety. God's salvation offers a new and honourable status because God's image is restored in us. The redeemed become royalty, kings, because we are blood-related to the king of the universe through Jesus' shed blood. Now, as royal family members, we join the mission of the royal family in the salvation of other human beings. This makes us priests. Christ had constituted his church a kingdom and its individual members, priests. To be a member of the kingdom is to be a priest. In Revelation 1-7, we find the urgency of mission. Jesus is coming and the nations will mourn because they are lost. God longs after those who are estranged from him. The book of Revelation opens then with God's mission for human beings. And so to finish the day, not only have we been created by God, but we have been redeemed by him, and at such an amazing cost too. Why should this truth give us so much hope, no matter our present situation? Monday, December 25, The Three Angels' Messages and Mission 
The book of Revelation gives us a powerful and graphic representation of the great controversy theme, perhaps most dramatically depicted in Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. It's hard to imagine how anyone can understand anything in Scripture apart from the great controversy motif, which will climax in the last days. Read Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. What is depicted here, and what have these verses to do with our mission and message? Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any one worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Central to mission, God's mission, is the message, God's message, the gospel. The message in a real sense is the mission. The world needs to be warned about what is coming upon it and every person will be forced to make a choice, a choice either for death or for life. He who is not with me, we read in Luke 11.23, is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. What is Jesus saying here that deals so directly with our mission? The three angels' messages of Revelation 14 form the core, the heart of what we as Seventh-day Adventists have been called to proclaim to the world. Central to it, foundational to it, are two themes, the everlasting gospel in verse 6 and the worship of the Creator. These two themes appear in this depiction of the saints in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. No matter what else we do, all the good that we do in helping people, we must never lose sight of our special calling and mission, which is to proclaim to a lost world the hope found in the everlasting gospel, as well as to warn the world of what will one day come upon it. And so to finish today, in Luke 11.23 we read, He who is not with me is against me. How do you understand what Jesus is saying to us here? Where is our heart at? Tuesday, December 26, The Final Crisis Jesus said to his disciples, and to us, in Matthew twenty-eight nineteen and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is the Great Commission, and in many ways the three angels' messages, with a call to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, as we read in Revelation 14.6, is simply the present truth of 2 Peter 1.12, an expression of the Great Commission. Let's read 2 Peter 1 and verse 12. For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. 
Read 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 Timothy 2, 4, and Genesis 12, verse 3. Why does every group of people matter to God? 1 John 4 and verse 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Genesis 12, verse 3, And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Christ's love is for all humanity, with no people group excluded. Contrary to the theology that teaches that Christ died only for a predestined elite, the Bible is clear that Christ's death was for all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, or any other factor. If you are a human being, Christ died for you. Period. The only question remains for anyone is, how do you respond to his death? When Jesus returns, there will be only two overt camps, those who have submitted to the authority of Satan through religious and political institutions, as shown in Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 17, and those who have fully submitted to Jesus Christ, whose faith is made manifest by their keeping the commandments of God, as it says in Revelation 14 verse 12. Since the beginning, human beings have had evidence of who God is and of his way of righteousness and love, as we read in Romans 1, verses 18 to 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened." Therefore, all human beings from ages past will be judged based on how they cooperated with God and how they lived, regardless of how much they did or didn't understand, as we read in Romans 2, verses 11 to 16. For there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, who did not have the law by nature, do the things of the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to the gospel. But in this time of the end there is a growing polarization and no longer will freedom or conscience be respected. People will be pressed to align themselves with Satan's party. It is urgent that the gospel be proclaimed and the serious news about Satan's strategies be exposed. And that is exactly what the three angels' messages and our mission are all about. So to finish today, dwell on the fact that Christ has died for you personally. What could possibly make you think that anything you have done, no matter how bad, could not have been sufficiently paid for by the death of Christ on the cross? Wednesday, December 27, Success in Mission What is success in mission? 
We might be tempted to think that it is many baptisms, big churches and rapid growth rates. We might feel that success consists of entering every tribe and people group on earth with the truth and that we can speed it up by using radio, the internet and TV. While all of this can be good, we must remember what Paul wrote to the community of faith in Corinth. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. In other words, our focus is to be on the process. God's focus will be on the growth. We have already seen that the object of God's mission is saving the lost in every people group on earth by making them loyal disciples of Jesus who are involved in his mission. Read the following texts. What do they tell us about the character of those who become followers of Jesus? First of all, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And Isaiah chapter 30, and verse 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way, walk in it, wherever you turn to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left. And John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And John 16, verses 12 and 13, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception, among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. And Hebrews 3, verses 12 to 13, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And First John 1, 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And the following verse, First John 1, verse Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Revelation 7 verse 14, and I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And Revelation 19 and verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Disciples of Jesus are pure, remaining loyal to him as a pure bride would to her betrothed. They follow Jesus as he leads them by the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. This includes leading us into missionary work for others. There is no deception in these disciples. They are not led astray by debilitating doubt, false teachings or immorality, and they do not feel morally superior to others. They recognize that they are imperfect, requiring God's cleansing grace and mercy. Understanding this, they also are open to receiving correction and instruction from other believers. Success in mission results in making this type of disciple. And so to finish the day, what does it mean in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2 to be a chaste virgin to Christ? How can we as sinners be this before God and point others to becoming chaste virgins to Christ as well? Thursday, December 28, Mission Complete. Read Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, and chapter 21, verse 22, through to chapter 22, verse 5. What is the scene described here? 
First of all, Revelation 21, beginning at verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And chapter 21, beginning at verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honour into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honour of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. What a paradise the new earth will be. Death and sin will be gone, Satan and wickedness destroyed. We will meet our loving Saviour and reunite with loved ones. And the new earth will be populated with representatives from every ethnicity and language. The General Conference Mission Board has approved global mission metrics that can be used to determine whether a people group is reached or unreached. A reached people group is one that has adequate numbers and resources to witness effectively to the rest of the group without requiring outside assistance. It has worship services, Bibles and other literature in their first language. And there are indigenous church leaders who can witness to the rest of the people group without working through a translator. An unreached people group is one that has no indigenous community of believing Adventists with adequate numbers and resources to witness effectively to their own group without assistance from outside their group. Each local church and conference must determine the people groups in their community who need to be reached. Now is the time to invest in God's mission of making disciples in all people groups, hastening our Saviour's return and, in the end, living with them in the new heaven and new earth that is promised to us here. And that brings us to challenge. How are you hastening Christ's return? Are you planting seeds of hope in the hearts of those who need to hear good news? Are you watering new believers by helping them learn what it means to live a life of loyal obedience to Christ? Pray for opportunities to communicate the promise of the earth made new with the people on your daily prayer list. And challenge up. Some of your disciples may be ready to accept Christ. This includes joining a church or group of believers. Put yourself in his or her place and imagine attending your church for the first time. What kind of experience would he or she have? How prepared is your church to welcome and disciple new people? Are you open to starting new groups of believers, not just building up your own existing church? 
create a strategy to address weak areas. Share your thoughts with your church leaders and work with them to implement a plan to become a more intentional disciple-making church. Friday, December 29. From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 342, we read, The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favour. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. End of quote. But before that can become a reality, it is our duty to partner with God in his mission to reach the world with the message of warning so that people can accept and be a part of God's promise of recreation. In a letter written to George I. Butler in uh, 1907, letter number 390, Ellen White wrote to him, I long to see very many labourers at work for those who know not the evidences of our faith. Many have received great light through hearing the three angels' messages, and now they should proclaim these messages in all parts of the world. I desire to do my part and to open the way for others to carry the light of truth. May the Lord help us to put the armour on. The believers are to unite in the solemn work of giving the last note of warning to the world. End of quote. Throughout this quarter we have studied various aspects and issues related to God's mission. This week, we concluded our study by exploring Revelation's keys to understanding what a restored relationship with God looks like. And it climaxed with a vision of the mission fulfilled, the recreation and restoration of the earth. While it is true that the destruction of sin and suffering will be the most terrifying days of Earth's history, God casts our vision to a time beyond this destruction and provides comfort and encouragement in the promise of the Earth restored. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. What is the everlasting gospel? Why is it everlasting? Why must what it teaches be foundational to our mission? 2. Why do we have such an emphasis on the three angels' messages? How do you respond to the argument that we need to focus on Jesus and not on something as supposedly negative as these messages, which include very strong warnings? 3. How has this quarter helped you better understand not only the importance of mission, but how you and your church could better participate in it, which is what we have been called to do. Dreaming Dreams Part 3 by Andrew McChesney Joseph Delamu had prayed to God to reveal his true church. But Joseph didn't know where to worship in Conakry, capital of the French-speaking country of Guinea in West Africa. After studying the Bible with his English teacher, a Seventh-day Adventist named Fortunate Caleb Lori, he fasted for three days and pleaded with God to reveal his will. Then Joseph had a dream in which he was locked up in prison. A prison guard was a relative and he begged him for freedom. I cannot free you even though we are from the family, the relative said. Joseph attempted to escape but was caught and reproved by his relative. Don't play with me, the relative said. If you try that again, I will punish you in a way that you will never forget. A voice boomed out with a description of the punishment. Someone will bring straw and put it under you and set it on fire, the voice said. Joseph understood that the punishment represented hell after Jesus' coming. He prayed, I'm not better than the others, only don't let me die here. I want to accomplish something for you before I die. After the prayer, he was somehow removed from the prison cell and into the presence of three soldiers. One soldier said, Joseph, you must pay the ransom for your freedom. Only God freed me, not you, Joseph replied. 
Jesus paid the price on the cross. I owe you nothing. But the soldier insisted, If you don't pay, we will take you back to prison. My freedom did not come from you, and you cannot go against God, who freed me, Joseph said. My life depends on God, and if you harm me, you are not harming me, but God. The soldiers left, and Joseph turned around and saw Fortunate. Your freedom is from God, Fortunate assured him. Then Joseph woke up. It was 3 a.m., and he was sweating. The dream seemed so real. He prayed, Thank you, God. Every time I ask for your help, you answer me. I thank you, not for answering me, but for loving me. Today, Joseph is 24 and a faithful Adventist. When I was a child, I asked God to lead me to the right path, he said. God answered this prayer by bringing me to the Adventist church. I am ready to serve God. Your 13th Sabbath offering this Sabbath will help spread the gospel in the West Central Africa Division, which includes Guinea. Thank you for your generous offering. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Lessons by Dr. Percy Harold and the inside story by his niece, Sibylla. Apart from being provided free to those who are visually impaired, these audio lessons are available on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministry app, on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, and also on YouTube. Search for Percy Harold Sabbath to find all of these. And remembering all the time that God is always faithful.